TDP event. This is <laughs> um, so welcome to uh, tonight's program, The Cricket Path to Success. And um, I am going to turn it over to JT, who's going to introduce our fabulous guest speaker for this evening. Uh, thank you, Mary. So hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's PDP event. Tonight, we have a very special a guest. Not only is he the father of two FDU students right now, but he's also been all around the business world. He started off as an accountant for the NHL, moved to ESPN, CBS, and then moved over to the media, where his company was also bought by Our Heart Media, where he's now the senior vice president. So without further ado, here's Mr. Kamal Patel. Thank you, JT. Appreciate it. Um, and, and can you all see my screen now? Yeah, we can. All right. So thank you. Appreciate that. Um, and here you're a finance major. So I uh, would love to connect with you. As you mentioned, I started in finance and accounting. Um, but let me give you all a little bit of background on me and then I'll take some questions and, and you know, Mary or anyone who has, uh, wants to jump in. So um, this is, I think, uh, Mary and Pat. Uh, titled this session, The Crooked Path. And most of that crookedness was in the beginning. Um, but let me go jump ahead right now. So right now I've got a family of six, I've got four kids. Um, I mentioned just a moment ago, I got into running recently. I'm a skier, like to watch movies, spend time with family, uh, camping. One, those are some of the things I enjoy. I mentioned I have a BS in accounting from Pace University in Manhattan. Uh, and I'm currently the Senior Vice President of Human Resources, Operations and Facilities for iHeartMedia. Um, the other thing you'll notice there, there's four Jeeps in there. So Jeeps are kind of my thing. Uh, I've actually owned five. And uh, the green one in the snow there is the girls, Asha and Maya, who both are FDU students. That's the ones they share with their other sister, Riva. And then uh, the red one is mine. And uh, that, I think my son, Sean, wants that one in the future, maybe. We'll see about it. Um, I started originally as a engineering and um, mechanical engineering and physics major up at Syracuse University. I attended there for a year and a half and had a phenomenal time, uh, probably too good of a time. And uh, we decided that I would come home and go to community college at County College of Morris. The original plan was come home, take all the core requirements here. It was less expensive um, and all that. So do that and then transfer back to Syracuse to finish my engineering degree. I got to County College. I um, had a great time. I started working there at the Math and Writing Center because I had taken a lot of the higher level math courses for engineering. Uh, so I started tutoring those classes, some of the basic classes at County College. And I started taking accounting and finance and econ and all those business classes. And I was a lazy student. I'll tell you that right from the beginning. And that was easier than going back to engineering. So I stayed for a year and a half at County College and got my associate's degree and then transferred to Pace University. Um, when I got to Pace, I started in as an accounting major. And uh, after my first semester, I became a RA in the dorms in Manhattan and realized that the RA compensation package for Pace at the time was really good. And you, if you took 12 credits, they were all paid for. And 12 was the minimum you had to take to be a full-time student. So I said, why would I take more than that? If they were paying for my dorm, a meal plan, and the 12 credits, I could pretty much stay there almost for free. And um, so I did that. And I dragged it out for an additional four years. Um, during that time, we founded a fraternity. We became part of the Teak National Chapter. Um, I was president of my fraternity, I was president of the, the uh, Greek Council, and I got an internship with the National Hockey League. The, at the time, the CFO of the NHL uh, was a Pace alumni, and through the uh, Career Services Office, similar to what you have available to you at FDU, I um, got connected with him and networked and got an internship there. So I was 12 credits, the semester is all I took. I got a job at the NHL. I started originally about 20 hours a week. By the time I graduated, I was almost 40 hours a week there full time. And uh, it was uh, upon graduation, they did offer me a position, but it was 1995 when I graduated. If you're a hockey fan, you know, in 94, Rangers won the Stanley Cup. And um, 
right after that, there was a strike. The whole league was on strike. So when they offered me the position, they offered me $26,000, but it was as a contractor, no benefits. Um, and at the time, the controller of the NHL said to me, so I can make you this offer. We want you to stay. But in case you're looking for something else, a more permanent with benefits, she had a friend that she had gone through, Ernst & Young, audit training with. Uh, she referred me over to him. I met with him uh, and the uh, president of the company that they had started, a small startup at the time called College Sport, uh, Classic Sports Television. Sorry, um, I met with them on Friday and Monday, uh, Sunday was graduation. Monday, they called me with an offer of 28000 a year with benefits. So I took that. Um, but, you know, and then I moved on from there. But this was kind of college and uh, the path I took. It took me seven years to get my undergraduate degree, but I wouldn't trade it for the world. I had an amazing time. The experiences I had and specifically the work experience I got from working at the NHL and the, the contacts I made were amazing along with all the other folks that I met, right? The other people that I met through the fraternity, through working events at school and everything else you did. Um, a lot of those people are still part of my network and people I reach out to these days or they re reach out to me. So as I said, started with uh, classic sports television. I was the 18th employee to join the company. Uh, we grew that company up to about 300 employees and three and a half years later sold that to ESPN and today it's ESPN Classic. Um, I stayed there post acquisition for about a year and a half. And um, at the time, and then they were looking to move everything to Bristol, Connecticut. Um, it was a nice job offer to move up to Connecticut, but we were getting ready to have our first child and uh, buying a new house in New Jersey. And so I took the severance package and uh, moved on. Uh, that picture just on the side there is Joe Namath and me at in my parents backyard um we needed to shoot a commercial for this startup network and we needed a place to shoot it and we had no money to rent a, a studio or anything so we just did it in the backyard um but after leaving espn i think i took the severance package i started consulting with aerosol shoes uh they were looking to do an uh, ipo so the company was getting ready to go public they're based in new jersey uh, as I mentioned, we were uh, getting our first house, having a baby. So it was very convenient. I took that position. About six months in, we realized that the IPO wasn't a good idea at the time. We found some issues and just in that market, um, it wasn't the right time for it. So we put that on hold. I also realized that, you know, having worked in the city and lived in the city for a while, the, um, you know, going to the strip malls for lunch every day wasn't working for me. Um, and you just didn't have the same services available and all that. So for me, it made sense to try and find something back in the city. A recruiter had reached out to me um, for a job at Morgan Stanley in the controller's office. I took the position. I had a team of 16 people that I was managing and we were doing the monthly consolidations for all the different divisions of Morgan Stanley, um, you know, private equity, their uh, commercial banking side, all the different things that were there doing the consolidations and the quarterly financial reports. So I was actually writing the script that the CFO read on the quarterly financial report for Morgan Stanley. Um, it was a very structured position. Again, great benefits, a really good career path. Just wasn't for me. And I got a call from the my old boss from Classic Sports, uh, who was the CFO, uh, his name is Scott. And, um, you know, shortly into it, he called and said that he was looking for a controller for Broadway video, which is where he had gone after we sold the company. And um, I went back into the city. I had got to take, you know, I, I was already in the city, but I got to take the suit and tie off, left Morgan Stanley and took a job back in uh, media and entertainment with Broadway video. Again, overseeing all the finance operations um, of the company consolidations across all the different divisions, which included TV production group, um, royalties for Saturday Night Live went through there. Um, this is Lauren Michaels' company. Uh, Lauren Michaels, who produces Saturday Night Live, owned the company. Um, they had a book publishing division, a record label, and a, it was a um, video post-production facility. So a lot of networks and others did their editing work at Broadway Video. I stayed there for about three and a half years, had a lot of fun with that. Um, and then the same recruiter that originally placed me back at Morgan Stanley called about a position at Forbes. 
And I got an offer at Forbes to be the assistant controller. And Forbes being a much larger company, and even though I loved Broadway video, unless my boss, the CFO, left, there was no next step for me there. So I went, I talked to him. Um, we had a, about a two and a half hour resignation conversation. And I left and I was walking back to Penn Station that day. And the um, original, uh, one of the, the president of and founder of Classic Sports called me up on my cell phone as I'm walking on the train and says, hey, we just heard that you're leaving Scott. And that means our deal with him is off the table. And you can come work for Brian and I, who the, the other co-founder of Classic Sports. And I said, Steve, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but what deal? And he said, we had a deal with Scott that we wouldn't try and hire you at our new startup as long as you work for him. But now that you've resigned, you can come work for us. So I said, no, 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 I'm leaving because I have a job offer, like this great job at Forbes and I'm looking, leaving for that. And he twisted my arm to at least meet with him and Brian and talk about what they were doing. So they had put together a venture capital fund, raised $30 million, started a short form content studio out of LA um, and convinced me to go work for them. So I called that recruiter who had now placed me at a second position and told them, unfortunately, I'm going to back out. Not something I recommend people do, but we, I literally, I'm not kidding. He called me two days ago asking if I was interested in other opportunities and asking if he could, if I could help him place people within iHeartMedia. So again, don't burn bridges. That may not have been the best move, but I kept in contact with him and we've worked together on many placements. He's placed people that in companies that I've worked at over the years. Um, so like I said, I joined this venture capital fund called Fusion Media Ventures. We had this short form content studio where we were creating video clips, small short video clips for distribution over the internet. However, this was before smartphones. It was before there was, you know, high bandwidth in people's homes. And so there wasn't really a great platform for consuming that content. We were creating it, but it wasn't, there was no way to really deliver it out to the end user. So the internet bubble had burst a little bit and we shifted gears and started consulting. Most of our team that we had put together, there was only eight of us in the company, um, had a sports background of some sort. There was a gentleman for the legal counsel from the NFL and, and a couple of uh, sports agents and other people. So we started consulting in various sports, uh, in the sports realm. So Razor Scooter hired us to do something. We did some consulting for the PGA Tour, um, did various other things. A broker came to us with a deal to acquire the WCW World Championship Wrestling, which um, no longer exists. It was now part of WWF, W, what is it? WWE. Uh, sorry, I was asking my son because he watches that. So um, we did an acquisition. I actually moved the family down to Atlanta for a while. Um, I was living down there for about six months. We announced the deal. Um, but then there was a management change of Turner and uh, Jamie Kellner, who runs the Turner Networks, decided for some reason wrestling wasn't family friendly, pulled the TV rights out of the deal. And therefore, it didn't it wasn't worthwhile for us to continue on the acquisition at the price. But WWE took it over because for them, it was taking their comp uh, competition off the shelf. And uh, and so they we backed out. They took over the deal, moved back up here um, and. Along the way, someone else came to us with an idea for a new sports TV network focused on college sports. So this gentleman, Chris Bevilacqua, um, came to us and we took the rest of the money we had in this venture capital fund and rolled it into college sports television. Um, by doing all the consulting and everything, we had conserved our cash. And so the investors in the fund never shut us down and we had a significant portion of that 30 million to now put into this new television uh, startup that we were doing. We um, launched College Sports Television uh, in April of 2003. It was the night that Syracuse won the uh, Final Four. We launched this network. We we're on 24 hours a day, um, rotating the same eight hour programming three times uh, back to back. And um, I was overseeing at the time, I, like I said, I started in finance and accounting. But now we had this group, I was, you know, there's just a handful of people starting this network. So 
we needed a facility, we needed to build studios, we needed to do all the HR work, um, we needed computers and, and IT infrastructure. And so, you know, everyone jumped in to do whatever needed to get done. And so I did all the build out, I did the facilities piece of it. We actually, because I was doing more of the administration now in HR, went back to my old boss from college sports and Broadway video or classic sports and Broadway video and hired him back to be the CFO and oversee the finance piece. Um, and that's where I started getting more into, you know, away further away from finance and accounting um, and more operations and administration. And then that company was acquired by CVS in 2005. Six months in, um, Scott, the CFO, and the founders of that, the other folks had left. The executive team pretty much left after six months. I happened to stay on and work through the integration with CBS. Um, and now today, it's all of CBS sports, the whole CBS sports function is the old team from class, uh, college sports television. And so, you know, like I said, I worked across the CBS now in a broader, bigger company. I worked on facilities, HR, safety, security. We had an industry-wide across all the different sports networks, um, you know, ABC Sports, ESPN, everything. We had a um, kind of an industry consortium working through safety issues and security issues at events. Um, so we started putting a lot of that, those things together and building, I started building more of a network across all of that. And after that, Scott had, after six months, had left and gone to a, another startup called Thumbplay. And in 2007, called me up and, at, and said he wanted me to come back and to work with him and be the VP of administration at Thumbplay. So I now left CBS and went back to another startup. Um, and the, the com company originally was a, a subscription-based service that offered wallpaper and ringtones for flip phones. And again, this was pre-smartphones. Uh, so um, it was an interesting business model. It was doing well, but then the smartphones came out and um, you know devalued what we were doing. We had contracts with the music labels for all the ringtones. And so we reached back out and got full track music licenses. Uh, now there was a platform that allowed us to distribute larger pieces of content to an end user anywhere they were. And so we went back and we got those licenses to stream full, full songs out. We started building a library um, and created a, a music streaming service. Um, we were starting to run out of capital though, because there were a couple times along the way, back when we were just flip um, uh, wallpaper and ringtone providers. And even shortly after that, when we first started doing full track streaming, where we had opportunities, we had offers to sell the company. The um, original CEO and founder uh, was looking for a higher price tag. Um, eventually, we were running out of money. And Clear Channel at the time, Clear Channel Media and Entertainment, was looking for a music streaming service to uh, either buy one or build one. And Clear Channel um, had just taken in a new management change the uh, new CF CEO was Bob Pittman, who had originally sta started MTV, had come into this company to help restructure it. And um, again, he said, you know, Pandora was already in the US, Spotify had already registered to come into the US. And uh, as they were looking to, you know, how to compete on the digital platform side and the streaming side, they ended up coming to us. And because we already had a relationship with them, they ended up buying Thumbplay. Um, so March 1st, 2011, we were bought by what was then Clear Channel. And, um, you know, I came in again, we, when we sold the company, when we sold Thumbplay to Clear Channel at the time, we only had 65 employees in our startup and Clear Channel at the time was 12,000 employees. So they bought the technology. And so I wasn't a software engineer. I'm not on the development side. I'm not a product, uh, digital product person. Uh, the expectation was probably gonna get some sort of severance package and start looking for a new job. Began interviewing. Uh, and then the chief HR officer of Clear Channel at the time uh, gave me a call and wanted to meet with me. And, you know, we said, we set up a half hour meeting, which turned into two hours. Um, and along the way, we had conversations about, you know, he was asking me about my background, what I did. 
and we talked about a number of different things. I would worked on real estate projects, uh, renovations, uh, HR, and a lot of administrative items. And so as we were coming towards the end of our uh, meeting, his assistant had come in and said, you know, your next interview is here. And he turned to me as we were walking out and he says, I don't even know why I'm interviewing this person. It's a, it's a candidate for a new pilot for the company planes. And he goes, I know nothing about aviation. So I said to him, hey, Steve, when you talk to him, just ask him what the yaw to pitch ratio is on, this, on the planes he's flying. I don't even know what that means myself, but I told him to ask that. And uh, it was something I remembered from uh, high school, right? Um, and so he said, we said goodbye. A couple of days later, he called me up and asked me if I would interview the pilot candidates and help select the final, uh, the finalists for that job. And so again, honestly, not really knowing it. I told him I was honest. I said, I didn't, not sure why you're asking me. He says, well, you mentioned something and I just thought you'd have a good perspective on it. So I ended up hiring the pilot. Uh, a month or two later, he called me up and said, uh, you know, we're building a new corporate headquarters for the company and we want you to be uh, the project manager for the whole thing. So I got that added to my plate. And over time, um, the job has grown, right? So it's undefined. Uh, in 2014, September 16th of 2014, um, we changed the name of the company from Clear Channel to iHeartMedia. And um, I was responsible for changing the name of the company. It was a six week project. We made the decision and the decision was in six weeks, we're gonna change it. Six weeks later, 12,000 employees woke up with a new email address, a new company name. Not all of our buildings because we have over 200 across the country, but many of our buildings, they had you know, overnight changed the signage on the building and unveiled it in the morning. So it was something that and, you know, didn't leak out in the press. The employees didn't even know it was really happening. Um, and you know, it was just a, a nice project to work on. Um, I'm also, like I said, because I've interviewed the pilot, I'm now fully responsible for the company's aviation program. And, uh, I'm also at this point in responsible for our pandemic response. So last year when the pandemic started, how are we responding? How are we getting our employees out of the offices and making sure they're safe? How are we continuing to operate? um in this new world um keeping our radio stations on air 24 hours a day all of that so i was responsible for the exit and now the response and how are we managing through it over the last almost year now and then now we're thinking about how do we go and reopen offices and get employees back into buildings and you know do all the do all functions come back or not so i'm responsible for um you know that that piece of the business as well so that's kind of College, career history gets me to where I am now. Um, if out of these things, some of the takeaways that I've had and to share with you all is, um, you know, listen and learn everywhere, right? I think being in accounting and when I started at the NHL, my job was accounts payable. And I was just processing bills. But it made me understand where the company's spending money. What, you know, what are all the different aspects of the business? Where does the money get spent? Why does it get spent? And processing expense reports was eye-opening, right? Um, but I think there's, you know, and there's a challenge now, especially with a lot of positions being remote, of the water cooler talk or overhearing what's happening around you. I think it's really important to be, you know, eyes and ears open all the time and just helps you understand the overall big picture of how what you're doing fits in with what everyone else is doing within the company. Um, I think you it's important to constantly innovate, whether it's you know, the company innovating and staying competitive with, um, you know, your products and services that you offer. But I think it's also in what you do and what your job is individually. You know, a lot of times we go into something and you set up a way or a process of doing something because that's what is based on your current knowledge, it's based on the current resources or technology that you have available. But you have to continually update that. Um, and I think it's just, you know, what, you're, what you do is you can change what you do and how you do it all the time. Even if it's the same end result, you can get there in a better way. And I think you learn from others that come in. Um, I think it's important to speak up and res respectfully dissent, right? You don't have to agree with everyone. And even if it's the CEO of the company, you don't have to agree with them. And I think there's, if you've got a good CEO, a good management team, there's, um, they, they're open to that, right? And I've always found that where, 
it's always good to share your ideas. If you don't agree with something, um, bring it up. Or if you have, you know, a, a new idea that or whatever it is, just I think it's important to speak up and, and again, um, listen, to, not only dissent when you feel that something's out of place, but listen to others dissent because that's how you learn, right? I think um, recognizing others' strengths and, and your own weaknesses is important. Uh, I hadn't done it until a couple of years ago and I'm, maybe many of you have done it, but there's the, uh, the book Strength Finders and the whole practice there. And find what you're good at and build on it, right? Um, as opposed to, you know, what your where your weaknesses are, you it's harder to change your weakness and make create a strength out of it as opposed to building on the strengths you already have, um, and then you know find people that have strengths in the areas you're weak in and leverage them and work together. Um, understanding emotional intelligence is a big thing now, and I don't know if that's um, covered in any of the coursework or anything you have, but there's it's really important of how you react to things and how you. Um, deal with situations when they come up um, it is important in in you know day to day and how you you know in the business world especially um, assume positive intent this is one that an old boss told me about one time he said you know everyone comes from a different background and you know you're all in college right now and so you've got you know you're meeting more and more people and the backgrounds of the people that you're uh, meeting are broader than they were when you're in high school. Everyone was from the same town and same kind of, you know, whatever it was. It gets broader and broader. As you get into the working world, it's even broader. I think you start looking at different types of people and what they're doing. When we, like from an HR perspective, when I communicate to the executive team, sometimes my wording is different and my approach is different than if I'm create, you know, going to my graphic designers or if I'm going to my on-air talent. We need to get the same message across, but people come come at things differently because of their background and who they are. But always assume that they're coming into a situation with positive intent. Everyone wants to do something good. It just might be that their background or their piece of the puzzle um, leads them towards a different path to get there. And the last item on here, which got cut off, is what do I have? Oh, network. So just network, 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 build your network, don't burn bridges. Um, the people that you're going to school with now, people that you work at your first job, your second job, along the way, like I said, over the years, um, I've got people from all the different jobs I've had before that still reach out. Um, I reach out to them. And so um, it's really important to build that because even if it's not for job purposes, building your network, there are like to get a job it's not for that purpose you can leverage those things in the people where people end up in the future you know someone here might become an insurance broker someone's gonna be an accountant someone's gonna be you know in a service that you may need and you can help each other down the road so those are my uh kind of takeaways and advice here and a little bit of background on what i do so now i will uh open it up if anyone's got any questions Thanks, Kamal. That was amazing. You're awesome. Now, for the most exciting part, we're going to get to hear from our students. So you can ask a question by typing in the chat or in the Q&A, or you could be really brave and let us know that you want to come up here and meet Kamal and ask your question yourself. So go ahead. Who's going to be first? I hope it's not one of my kids. <laughs> I'll start with one, Mary, if you don't mind, since I'm already on here. Pretty good. Um, when you guys are hiring new people and people who are looking for their first time jobs, like what's some of the main important things you guys look for from iHeart? So I think for us, a lot of it, and it could depend on the, the different types of roles, but I think a lot of it is, um, you know, it's, it's the fit into the, um, the environment. For us, it's constantly changing. I think it's adaptability is important. Um, and then, like I was saying, People are open to, you know, providing their opinions, speaking up and, and being part of the conversation that we have as a company and as a management team and, and you know, that's across all the employees. So I think it's, um, you know, there's a, there's a level of comfort. There's a level of, um, you know, someone who's, I guess, eager. Um, there's a lot of it too, right? Um, looking for people who are um, 
we want people to get involved, right? And so um, that, that's, that's a good piece of it. Um, and then adaptability, because things do change all the time. Our company changes, our industry changes. Um, so that's, that's it on that piece. Thank you. Yeah. What's next? There's a question in the chat. How did it feel to have so many different jobs and positions in so many different work environments? That's a question <laughs> from Tiana. So, um, you know, I think I've migrated back to this very similar environments, being in the media and entertainment industry, but it's definitely been eye-opening. And I think that's part of it too, right? You have to know yourself and what works for you. And we get it all the time of, you know, we hi we've hired people and listen, I think if you get into, as a, people work up into management, hiring is not an exact science. And if you get, the, you know, the right person for the right, for, for a job, half the time, you're a genius, you've figured it out. <laughs> and so um, I think for me, um, it's, it's, it's been great, but I think, you know, you, you need to understand what works for you. Uh, each person's different. We bring people into positions sometimes and they seem like the exact fit. Um, and they're, you know, you gotta be honest with yourself too. We have people come in and say, yes, I love chaos and I love change and everything. And then they get there and you know what, they're not comfortable with these things. And so I think that's part of that emotional intelligence piece of it. Understanding what works for you is important. Um, great. There's a lot of questions coming in. I love it. This is one of my favorite questions to ask. Um, what is the biggest challenge you've had to overcome in this position? So in, I guess the, my initial challenge was keeping a job, right? And it was, we, we thought we were going to be, uh, they, they bought the company and I, all the um, non-engineering folks thought we were going to be gone and, you know, pretty quickly. And so originally it was just, being comfortable speaking up, right? Now I've come from another startup and into this bigger company. Um, and in this, this past time, I was put closer to the senior executives. So, so I was working closer with the CEO level, uh, the C-level uh, management team. And so I think it's just, you know, it, it, it can be a challenge, but you have to be comfortable with it. Everyone, again, you know, assume everyone's coming out with positive intent every day and everyone started somewhere, right? I think one of the things just in my head has always been, you know, if someone else can do something, so can I, I just may not have the experience there, may not have, it may not be my interest level or, you know, you don't have the skill, you haven't gone through the education to get to something. But if you want to get to something and you go through the same path, you can get there as well, right? So I think that's, um, it, I think the challenges here are, um, you know, some of it's also just, it is the pace that this company moves at and it's evolved so much in the last 10 years that I've been here. Uh, but every single one of those things has been an opportunity to do something new and different for me. Yeah. That's awesome. We have more questions, but Paige would like to ask you a live question, Paige. Okay. Thank you. So Kamal, my question would be for the great leaders that you've um, met in your career and the people you worked with, what were the qualities that they had that made them great leaders? So that's an interesting one, Paige. I think there, and there's, I've had great leaders and they've been completely different types of people, right? So I think for the industry that I ended up in, some of them are um, risk takers, right? And so having been in startups, you've got to be willing to take a risk. I think even today where I am now, this is a very large established company, but our CEO is open to taking risks and risks, meaning, you know, calculated risks, well thought out risks. It's a, and, and I think one of the greatest things that in the few CEOs that I work with that I really respect are, um, it's okay to make a, a mistake, right? You, you can plan it. Just like I said, with hiring, you can plan, you can interview someone 10 times and have a whole team of people interview them. Everyone decides they're the right person. Mm, they get in six months in, it's not a good fit. And then you have to figure that out. And that happens, but it's okay. It's okay on both sides, the company side and the employee side, because 
you want to end up where you're where it makes sense for you. Um, so I think, you know, that that kind of gets into it. I don't know if that answers your question or not. It does. Thank you. Well, this is Pat. I'm not turning on my camera right now just because I don't want to screw it up, but I'm going to read some of the questions from the Q&A for Mary. Um, what is one piece of advice you wish someone would have told you before going into the media field? Wow. Um, well, so this is, this. I don't, I'm not sure if it's advice or it's, it's worked out this way. And my wife says this all the time. So, so you know, the, the kind of background of the, the doctors and lawyers and those people who work all the time and they're just, you know, all, media is like that too. You end up in media. It is a 24 seven. My job is 24 seven. I'm on call. Um, and you know, we are, our radio stations broadcast 24 hours a day. When I was in television, you're on 24 hours a day. So that's one thing I didn't know, but it's not, it wouldn't have stopped me. And, and right now I really enjoy it. It's part of, you know, one of the things that I, I enjoy about my job. Um, I'm trying to think about what I wish. I, there's no, there hasn't been any pitfalls that I'd say I wish someone had warned me about. So. Okay, fair enough. Um, another, I love these questions. They're really great questions, students. Who is the most imp important person you connected with that helped lead you to your current position and where did you meet them? A teak brother, right? <laughs> it was, uh, they were very important, but um, I think probably the most important one, that, like as far as career connections and as, that I've worked with now many a time is uh, Scott Marshall, who was the CFO at Classic Sports, who hired me right out of college. Um, and as I mentioned, he and I then worked together uh, at Broadway Video, again at cl college, cl classic sports, then Broadway Video, then college sports television, then Thumb Play. He did come over to uh, iHeart or Clear Channel at the time for a short time, but then left. So, you know, that many times we've, he's hired me or I've hired him back and forth. So from a career path, that was probably my most yeah. important connection. And by the way, the interview I had with him coming out of, uh, you know, as I mentioned, I, the Friday before my graduation, I interviewed with him and I, he knew I'd worked at the, the NHL. Turns out he's a huge Buffalo Sabres hockey fan, uh, grew up in Buffalo. Um, and our interview, we, the two hours I spent with him, we talked about hockey. Yeah. And I don't, I, I'm, I, I've, for years now, I've been trying to remember if he asked me anything about accounting. <laughs> but yeah, so... That's, but I think a good point that comes out of that is you never know where these connections might lead to down the road, yeah. right? And also, also different things you connect on. You yeah. know, you get to know people in different ways. It's not always accounting or whatever. Um, the next question, um, and I, I'm sorry, I feel like we're just like rifling questions at you. <laughs> yeah, go at it. Do you think it's important to have a passion for a certain job or apply valuable skills to as many jobs as you can? Um, I do think that it's important to be happy doing what you're doing, right? Um, and if you have a passion for something, you should definitely go after it. Um, but I, you know, I also just, for me, it's always been great to like dip my toes in other things, right? I've got my hands in many, many different things right now. Um, and I enjoy that, but I will say again, going back to kind of just knowing yourself and what's right for you, that may not be right for everyone. You know, there's, there is a, be honest with yourself, right? And I've had people come and I've had people leave our company and go to another company because they got promoted into a management position. And, and on a story, a couple of years ago, we had someone who got put into a uh, software engineering company as a, a lead engineer and is now managing a group, group of, I don't know, maybe nine or 10 people. After the first year there, he called up and asked if he could come back and just have a staff a position with no direct reports at all. He didn't want to manage people anymore. He didn't like doing annual reviews. He didn't like having to manage people and any of it. And he's been, he's now been back with us for a few years and knows what he knows, knows what he likes and is honest with himself. And, and now he's really happy, right? And he's got a passion for doing what he's doing. He wanted to potentially do more, but he stuck with it. So I think it'd go either way, right? I probably go to one extreme where I get involved in too many things, but I, and I have full respect for the people who say, you know what, I'm going to be the best, whatever, 
and, and pick their, their lane. And sometimes I guess it, it takes um, trying something to know that you don't like that. And when you were going through your presentation, I was, I was really taken by, um, you seemed kind, pretty self-aware at a young age. Like for instance, when you knew, like most people would have probably taken that gig in Bristol, Connecticut. Cause you know, it's the, in, on paper, it was the right thing to do, but you knew it wasn't right for you and for your family. And I, you know, I think you talked about EQ and, and that takes part of that to come up with those thoughts, I think. Um, mm. The next question is, is there any advice for a college student looking to enter the sports world on the business side? Um. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it depends on what part of the business, what the major is and where you're going into. Um, there's, there's, by the way, first of all, I ended up in it as an accountant and I wasn't looking at sports and I'm, I like sports. I like to play sports. I, unless I'm working at the league or <laughs> working at one of the networks, I usually don't watch a whole lot except for the big, big games. Um, but I had a, huge career in sports, right? And I was the one person who never knew what everyone else was talking about because they were a wealth, you know, they had the sports encyclopedia in their heads and I don't know any of it. But um, it doesn't matter what you're, like if you're in a business function, whether you want to go into sports or anything, there's, you know, a lot of these things that like, you know, finance, accounting and all, it's available in every industry, right? Um, I think it's great. I've had a little bit of an opportunity to do it in different industries. Uh, but wanting to go into sports depends on, you know, kind of which piece you want to get into. There's the, you know, athletes, managing athletes and the, the talent management piece of it. Um, there is the leagues. Um, I will tell you one of the things that I found from working at the NHL. They're a great place to work. Um, we used to call it glamour equity, right? And you get paid a good, you make a good living and everything else. But there is... In, in all of it, sports, music, entertainment, a little bit of glamour equity. Um, so if you're looking for making money like an investment banker does, you're not going to find that in some of these other places, but you got a different, you know, platform that you're working in. Um, what about like, but, but like a, a college student, like entry level, I, I mean, I happen to know these students, so I know they happen to be a finance major, okay. but um I, I would like say how, like, how do you break in? Like, what's the trick or is there a trick or you just, I'm not sure there's a trick, but there's those positions are available in every, whether it's in the sports networks and the sports leagues, the sports teams, they all have accountants, they all have finance people. They all have, you know, so um, I think put it out there, but if you have a network of, if you know people that are in any of those businesses, uh, definitely reach out. I'm happy to connect people as well. If you want to re if anyone wants to reach out and say, you know, looking to get into here, still have contacts, um, you know, in some of this, the, mostly on the television side, so CBS Sports, um, a little few at ESPN still, from that perspective. Not as many at the leagues anymore, but I think it's- Can the students uh, connect with you on LinkedIn? Yep. Feel awesome. free. Awesome. We, we have a few more questions in uh, the Q&A. Sean Ferry has a question. Sean says, hi, Kamal, thanks for the talk. I've been in the game for a while, I remember, Fusiant and also created web content for Thumbplay. Oh, wow. I would love to know what your take is on what you know versus who you know, if you can give us a percentage. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question, Sean. And uh, it's, we work together at some point. Um, the who you know versus what you know. Um, I, think, I, I think it's probably 50-50, right? You have to you what you know is obviously very important you you look you can you know I, I got lucky that even though my interview didn't have any accounting questions in it I knew it once I got there right you you can get there and you still have to prove yourself once you're in the door so I think that's important you have to know your your what you but but the who you know is is very important and I think that's what over time and it may not be just who you know to get in the door, but it's also as you grow in your career, that building those relationships stronger and stronger um, as you move up. Um, you know, there's there's a time for each, right? You gotta you gotta know your stuff to be able to le then leverage the uh, the network that you're building. Um, but if you you know, and by the way, there, I've had people say, 
I want to do this on my own. I don't want to go through the who I know, right? I don't want my parents' contacts or my professor's contact or whatever it might be. Uh, I would say leverage everything. There is, um, you know, I, in the HR world, I look at resumes all the time and it's, the, the, you know, unless something sticks out, we, we, we put it, we, when we post a position, if I post a entry level position within 24 hours, sometimes depending on the role in the city it's in, we can have hundreds of resumes. I mean, we get, uh, we had a position in New York city recently with 487 resumes in, uh, in two days. And so, you know, how do you get to the top of that list and, and get into the consideration set? Um, leverage who, you know, if you have the opportunity. Absolutely. That's great advice. So now we know Kamal. So if that job came up, we can leverage Kamal. See that? This is how it works. Um, <laughs> Stephanie has a question. Stephanie would like to know, and this is one of my other favorite questions. If you could give your younger self one piece of advice, what would it be? I'd do it all over again. Um, just keep going. Uh, that's similar to the question before of if, you know, what would I wish someone else would have told me? I think um, I, I don't, Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for that one. That's good. That's good. You do it all over again. I love that. Um, Pat and Paige, any more questions from the chat that I can't see or the Q&A? Yeah, we have a great one from Zoe Markham. How do you think companies can innovate and improve now, especially in today's age of COVID, social media, and everyone moving online? So Zoe, that's a really good question. And that's one of the things that I'm working on uh, regularly at this point. Um, I think, you know, look, one of the things going into pre-COVID, uh, we used to mock uh, a lot of you who are millennials and, you know, all over social media and say, you know, you're always in your device, always in your devices. Going into COVID, that was a potential advantage where you're very comfortable connecting that way. I think what happens is, you know, mentioned before, Early in, the, in my career, I was sitting in a cubicle out in the open with other people, hearing what was going on around me, whether it was within my own department, uh, departments adjacent to us, or just people walking by and talking about business things. And so there's a challenge. And I said, I said, for you all to listen and learn from everywhere you go, how do you do that if positions are becoming more remote, right? Whereas a lot of companies are now saying a lot of, you know, they're not gonna have 100% of their staff back in offices. It's gonna be a lot more remote. How do you create those connections? I think that's gonna be an important, um, you know, whoever solves that is, <laughs> is, should get a, a prize, but I think that's gonna be really important for all of you as you go into the workforce. And it, especially if you go into positions that are remote beyond COVID. Um, you know, so the, the whole, your, your part about move, everything moving uh, online. Um, I do think, you know, there's advantages to it. I think, you know, I, I found a lot of different advantages for myself is, you know, without the commute, being home with family more often and all that. Um, it does open up a, new a lot of new challenges in the workplace. Like for, for us, because we are, um, you know, across all the time zones, you've got people now coming in to work at different times of the day. We're making accommodations for people because they're home. And so they're, they have family obligations and other things sometimes in the middle of the day. So for some of us, your day gets longer and longer because you're accommodating people in multiple time zones. Um, and there's something about, you know, we used to go to the office and there was, a, even though I'm available 24 hours a day and on call and we all have our cell phones and emails on there as well. Um, there's some, there was something in the past about your day started when you walked in the office and it kind of, you know, there was a soft end to it when you walked out of the office. And now this is my living room and this is my office and it's my house. And so you never leave. And there's something about not having that kind of break that you, for me, at least, and I've, I'm hearing it from a lot of people in the workforce. So sharing that with you all is that the day is kind of just spread out. The work day is con continues to get longer um, for a lot of people. So I don't know how that's going to impact, um, you know, all different types of positions and, and entry level, but uh, something that's out there. And, you know, I don't know if that is, uh, that's what you were trying to get at, but. Yeah, no, that's great. That was a great answer. Perfect. Nick has a question and uh, I like this question too, because I um, used to teach a class and we use the strength finder. Nick wants to know what were your five strength finder traits that you got when taking this test? Um, 
So Nick, my, my trades, they're still on the wall of my office that I don't go to anymore. Uh, they are there and I have to think about it. I should know these, right? Um, but uh, part of it was the, the being okay with change, right? And, and we call it, in our company, we call it just the chaos, but it's kind of an organized chaos sometimes, um, if that's possible. Um, uh, one was um, visual. It's, uh, you know, visual aptitude was one of them. Um, uh, I can't remember them. I'm sorry, Nick. I, don't, I wish I had them here. And I haven't looked at them in a while, in, in almost a year. Um, it was visual aptitude, chain, adaptability, um, uh, analytics, uh, like I think um, analytic skills. I don't remember what the specific strength finders item was there. And um, I can't remember the rest. I'm sorry. I don't remember mine either, so I don't feel bad. <laughs> I, the last time I actually did it was, it was six, seven years ago. It was three years after I started here is when I actually did it. And, but I, it's, I do have it hanging on my wall. I just don't, I haven't looked at it in a long time. No, I totally, totally get it. Another question. What are some of the biggest challenges when working in a startup business? So startups are, I mean, I, I think it's just great, but you are, um, one, you know, it depends on how, early stage or well, I mean, one of the things is getting funded, right? When you have an idea and you go pitch your idea and you want people to put money behind it, um, that's always, the that's your initial challenge, right? Especially if you're looking to, to start the startup. Um, and then it's, you know, it's being scrappy. You don't have processes. Every Everything you do, you're creating, right? You don't have a policy, a creative policy. Now you can go and, you know, leverage other people's policies or find uh, things online now. But um, I, I think it's a challenge of a startup. It's also the opportunity, right? It's the opportunity to do more and more. Um, you know, you've got to build a name. And if you're going in, those people going into marketing, uh, you've got to build a brand and you've got to sell it. And you got to, you know, so those are, those are challenges. You're, you're starting something that no one's ever heard of, right? And, um, and then when you have competitors, how do you deal with that? Like if you're the small fish in a big pond, right? So um, I think that's, those are from a business standpoint, those are some of the challenges. Absolutely, I totally agree. Walter has a question. Kamal, at Fusiant Media Ventures, you mentioned consulting. Were you involved with consulting on the finance side of the business or consulting on the marketing advertising side for your customers? So there was interesting. Some of the some of the consulting gigs we did. One I mentioned was Razor Scooter. So Razor Scooter, if, if everyone's seen the razors, but when they were a big thing, it actually the international aluminum prices went up because they were selling so many, and that lasted for about a year, and they tanked. And so they came to us and asked us about how do we promote our brand again. And we had Paula Abdul come out to the Razor Scooter empty swimming pool where their team razor practice. And we did this whole video for them to try and, and she choreographed it of like making razor scooter cool again. When we consulted for the PGA tour, they had three audiences that they were trying to reach. They wanted more women to play golf. They wanted more uh, kids to get into golf. And um, I think it was Hispanics to play golf at the time, right? So those are the three audiences. That, and so we consulted on helping them put together events and plans of how to reach those audiences and get those people more involved uh, there. Um, we did consulting in the action sports industry and it was really, um, we were going around the country looking at small businesses that had local events. There was uh, in Vancouver, Washington, uh, Vancouver, Canada, sorry, Vancouver, BC, there's um, Slam City Jam, which is part of the Vans Triple Crown skateboarding tour. And we were looking at taking that event and combining it with another event. And a guy out of Orange County, California, who was building skate parks and the guy with a tractor who creates the gravity game set every year. We were trying to pull these into one consolidated business. There were, there were people who wanted to do that and we were consulting for them. Um, so it was really, it, I, we weren't focused on any one area. We were really overall business, right? And I, I did focus on when we got into these things and we looked at some of the consolidations and we did some consulting on the M&A piece of it. So I was, at that point, my, my role was more on um, doing the financial due diligence, right? 
auditing and, and whatnot uh, for me. But as a group, we were kind of consulting on business transformation and those kinds of things. Awesome. Pat and Paige, am I missing any questions? There, there's a couple with regards to um, similar themes, maybe not exact. So Ali wants to know, Kamal, when hiring, do applicants who come recommended by someone within the company have a better chance of getting the job? It doesn't hurt. Um, you know, I think, as I mentioned before, uh, sometimes you get hundreds of resumes and you look at, you know, you're 10, 15 in and you find three good can potential candidates. You know, you, it's just you know, realities, to be honest with you, you may not get through all of them. Now, there are now tools and, uh, and you know, um, AI that helps you cull all of them. But um, as a hiring manager, you may not see every resume that comes in. So if someone internally says, hey, here's um, someone I've worked with in the past or someone, I look, I get a lot of times it's, you know, the neighbor's kid or it is, you know, a guy I went to college with best friend and th there may not be a direct, but at least I'll look at it. Right. So like I said before, if you can network and leverage people, you know, it doesn't hurt. That's great. Any other questions, Paige or Pat? I think you got them all. Yeah. You got them all. Okay. Oh, I don't, unless you see one page. The Morgan Stanley one. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what was the work environment at Morgan Stanley like years ago? As a finance major, and obviously it was a while ago, I'm curious why you were only there for six weeks. So I, it was actually a really nice environment. Like I said, it, it was really good people. Um, the, it, it, I had a great team um, and, and great benefits and everything else. The reason I was there were only six weeks is because this was another one. It potentially wasn't for me, right? One, it was a suit and tie job. And I had gotten into the media thing and I wore jeans and a t-shirt to work for a few years. So that was one piece of it, but that's not really the reason. Um, the man, Look, for me, it, it was, I think I mentioned I had a team of 16 people. Uh, about, you know, a couple of weeks into it, I went to talk to um, my manager at the time. And I said, look, do we, you know, based on the workload, doesn't feel like we need this many people, right? And it was just not a place where we were making reductions or, you know, you you kept the, you know, once you had the budget and you had the staff and you kept it. I had come from a startup background of always, like I said, being scrappy and, uh, you know, trying to do the best you can with, you know, you didn't always have the resources. So it's a different mindset and for me, it wasn't the mindset that, you know, I got excited about, right? Again, it was a great job. I actually, the, the one time I, the first quarter I was there, the, it was right near quarter end and we did the script and working through that. I thought that was really exciting. Um, but, and then, you know, an opportunity came up to go back and, you know, this was again, who pulled me through my, my career. And we've worked together many times. My old boss from prior job called me up again and it was an opportunity to go do something um, in an industry that I had I'd already been in and was comfortable with. Awesome, that's great. Um, you met so many celebrities and stars. Um, were you ever starstruck? Like anybody that really, um, I don't know. Um, you know, so I'm not sure about starstruck. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, I was a little starstruck by. Um, and I had, this is, uh, I'm trying to think, mm, not really. I, I uh, athletes maybe, like even some way back when, like I was hanging, I was happened to be in the locker room with Wayne Gretzky, you know, when he, they, when they won the cup and um, like, that was really cool. And um, Joe Namath was at our house. So we, you know, but he fell asleep on the couch at one point, <laughs> he was really tired. Um no, that's, I don't know. Just a day in the line of work, right? <laughs> I think it's also when you're, when, if you choose that, like you have to keep it professional all the time, right? You can't, like, that's part of your job. And, um, you know, 
like I, I told Taylor Swift's mother, she couldn't walk past the rope because I didn't know who she was. And Taylor was walking, that's my mom. Like, oh. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think that, by the way, it's, you know, look in anything you do, whether it's your, a coworker or a, a, a celebrity you're working with or whatever it is, um, you've got people who come from all different places and they're just, they're just people too, right? You're going to respect what they're doing. And, and uh, so when you're working with them, it's different. I think you have to set, set a different mentality going into it. Wow, amazing. And uh, when was your aha moment? Like, when did you realize, wow, I really, I really made it. Like, <laughs> I don't know that I have, like, I, you know, it'd be just, I, I, I just continue enjoying it. Right. I think, um, there's still room to do something bigger. There always is. Right. You're very humble. Oh. Amazing. This was terrific. We really appreciate your time. I mean, amazing. This was great. Well, I want to say uh, thanks, JT, for the introduction. Uh, thanks, Asha, for preparing my deck. Uh, Maya, for all the...